it was um, quite a long road because I started when I was very, very young. And my parents were uh, amateur theatre nuts, and so I was running around helping with costumes and playing small children when they needed small children to be played and building sets and all of that kind of stuff from about five years old. So, But they both of them worked during the day and that was what you were supposed to do. You were supposed to take your uh, life seriously in whatever paying job you did um, and then have a good time uh, uh, in the amateur theatricals. Um, and I, so I got bitten by the bug uh, way back then. There was never a time when I wasn't doing it really. And then I went to university um, and discovered that that was a, a huge stamping ground for all of this. This was Cambridge in the, in the early 60s. Um, and uh, so that simply increased my appetite, but I still had the, had the notion that what you had to do was to get a, get a proper job. So I went and got a proper job with Reckitt and Coleman and then discovered that I was very depressed by that um, and went and uh, submitted myself to a sort of scholarship scheme which Granada Television then had and they would take in six people a year and run them for about six months as trainees. They were called graduate trainees. Um, and I became one of those and from then on I went up through television first and then when and British movies were terrible in the uh, in, in the 60s but but things were very exciting in television wonderful writing um, and the British film industry was alive well and living in Shepherd's Bush um, uh, and that's then I got tired of um, tiny budgets and I wanted to see whether I could um, sort of make movies and so I, I pushed off again. The film that most affected me when I was, in, was an early teenager was a Jean Renoir film called La Grande Illusion which is set in the First World War and is about a working class officer who finds himself in prison camp, he's a French officer played by Jean Gabin, finds himself in prison camp with an enormously varied um, cast of characters from all over French society, from um, uh, bourgeois people, from people who work with their hands, um, to great uh, aristocrats that covers a whole vast range. Um, and what you're watching is a, an enormous change in the world. Um, the aristocrats who are represented by one Frenchman and the German commandant of the, uh, of the, of the prison camp um, are ostensibly enemies, formally they are enemies, but they know one another and they have ridden to hounds with one another and they have the same friends. They speak three languages, they converse fluently in uh, French, German and English and you see them doing that. And then on the other side you have Gabin who is this tough working class guy and what you know is that the old order is changing. Um, and in the end, who are the, uh, who are the survivors? The aristocrats are not the survivors. The aristocrats fail to survive this story. Um, and Gabin, as a, a tough working class guy, um, does survive. And there, there's an extraordinary sort of humanity in it and an enormous range of, uh, of characters. And it's an atomization of French society and how it's going to change because of the war, but it's going to change anyway. Um, and I was bowled over by how complicated and humane it, uh, it was and how surprising, it's very surprising. Lots of stuff happens that you would never begin to, uh, to be able to imagine. Uh, you just have to see the film. It's, it's the, I think, still that and um, the leopard 
are still the two most complicated films that I've ever seen. Well, I thought a lot about that because, of course, the difference between now and when I started is that when I started, it was ludicrously easy compared to now. Um, there wasn't anywhere near the press. You didn't have the university courses in um, media studies and so forth. None of that. There were no film schools. Um, and so the only way to make your way was through the established organizations. As I said, I, I'd started with, um, with Granada Television and then worked my way around the industry from there. The BBC and all of the, the TV companies and then up into films. You couldn't do that now because there's just so many people pressing for the, the very few. And so it seems to me that what the only thing that you can do is to, is to do it for yourself. You have to form cooperatives. You have to not worry about, I mean, if you can get a job, then fine. It's something that pays, then fine. Um, but you don't have to have um, a, a job in the industry that, that pays. Are you, how much are you going to learn as a runner? You'll learn where the sushi restaurants in Soho are, but you, you, know, you, you need more than that. Um, and uh, I think that people should, should make little companies. They should get together. They should become uh, small bands of, um, uh, of friends. That you don't look for a normal channel, an accepted channel to give you a start. Get together, get one of those things. There's, you know, almost every household has one now. Um, you can make films in, in infinite variety of ways. Where when I was trying to do it, it was very clumsy um, and uh, very slow. Um, you had to have a lot of money, and so this, the notion of working your way up was very important. And now it just isn't. If you have people who have the same ideas you have and who are your friends, make a company, make a make a group. It doesn't even have. Don't, don't call it a. Don't call it a company. Make the stuff and release it yourself on the um, on the internet. And of course, I'm geriatric now. Um, and of course people are doing that already. Um, I'm sure that's, that's the way that it should be. It should be to step outside the normal channels and make your own channels, which means you'll make your own stuff, which means that it will actually, what you make will represent you.